uh, title of the lesson is, Do You Listen to the Right Things? Meaning, what do you pay attention to? What gets your attention? And let's look at, uh, quickly, Acts 2.38, because um, I want to understand something about God, because when you are uh, with God, it, everybody has different types of uh, times. And sometimes you feel close to God, and sometimes you may not. But you got to understand, God is not far from any of us. He's never been far from any of us. And that's in Acts 17, 26. I'm not going there, but it says, God determines the exact times and places where people should live so that perhaps they may reach out and seek him and find him. And then it says, though he's never been far from any of us. That blows my mind because before I really sought him and understand, understood what it means to, how to be saved as a Christian, as Jesus defines in the Bible, I believed in God, but I was no more right with God than the man on the moon. On, because once I got honest with the Bible, my life didn't line up at all. Yeah. And, but, but the thing that really just me, it says God has never been far from me. So in my craziness, my sin, my not even really paying attention to his word or wanting to it, but believing in him, I realized he was never far from me. He didn't just walk. He said, I've had enough because my behavior was sinful, 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 yet he still was not far from me. Yes. You know, sometimes if people annoy you and irritate you, you you've had enough. I mean, we're, we, we, and as Christians, we, we got to say we keep loving, right? Amen. And how many, like even the disciples, like how many times do I forgive this dude? He's ticking me off. And Jesus goes, seven <laughs> times 77. And then they're going, you got a calculator? And he's going, no, no, that's not the point. Seven times 77 says it's a perfect number. It means no matter how many times you need to keep forgiving. Yes. <coughs> That's who we're following. That's who we're becoming like. Let's look at Acts 2, 38. I want to just establish something. I actually pick it up in verse 36. So let, ev let uh, uh, everyone in Israel know for certain. God made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, your children, and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 rather than the number that day. This was the entrance into the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God arrived on earth. God has always been there. This is even for the Jews. The God-fearing Jews from all nations were called here at Pentecost. The ones that died before faithful in the old covenant died still believing that the Savior needed to come and they needed to be forgiven. But since they died, they died waiting, believing. Those of us who are alive and the Jews, he said, listen, you guys are alive. You hear Jesus is the final plan of God. Yeah. Today, Jesus still is the final plan of God. And what did God bring Jesus to? Before he said he's going to be your savior, you got to get this part. God made Jesus, whom you crucified, your Lord and savior. Savior, you're just being saved. You, you didn't do anything. He's, we're, he's saving you. But Lord is conviction, repentance, because then he goes, what do we need to do? He says, repent and be baptized. Not some of you, every one of you. For what? You go into the water, sins are forgiven, and then God promises that the, His Holy Spirit, Him, not it. The Holy Spirit's not it, it's Him, it's masculine. The Holy Spirit of God dwells, will indwell in your heart because He sees that you want to be right. You've acknowledged the areas of your life that are sin, and you promise the rest of your life as you see the good you ought to do and understand areas that don't please him, you're making a commitment to be faithful and change and depend on him to help you change the rest of your life. Yeah. The Holy Spirit indwells at that time. Amen. India 
that's going to happen for her. And I always say when someone today, when she gets baptized, when you get baptized, anytime someone gets baptized, the way Jesus defines it, the way the Bible defines it, the faith in the blood of Jesus, a miracle happens between that person and God. Their sins are forgiven. There's a starting point. And that's where we are. Now, look at 2 Corinthians 1, 19. Breaking down the platform here. So, so you get your sins forgiven and you receive the Holy Spirit at baptism. Repent and be baptized, right? That's the beginning. The, the apostles in the rest of the New Testament are going to contradict each other. As you follow through all the, all the, uh, the, the conversions, they're all, they're, Peter and Paul and all the rest of the disciples, they're not going to start wandering out and just massaging it. Oh, well, they did that over in Philippi, but you just come here. We, it's two miles down to that water, so just... God knows our heart, so just say this little prayer after me. You'll be okay. They didn't do that. Right. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, not some of you. Come on. It's humility. Yeah. Now, 1 Corinthians 1, 19. Uh, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 1, 19. Excuse me. 2 Corinthians 1, 19 says here, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silas, Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him has always been yes. So the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is preached among you, here's Paul speaking to the Spirit to the church in Corinth, but he's saying it's the same message that Peter preached. Come follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Deny yourself. It's what Jesus taught them all. And then the Great Commission, go make disciples of all nations, baptize them. He's saying, listen, he's reiterating. The message for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silas, Timothy, was not yes, no, but in him it's always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen, which means so be it, is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now, it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us. Now, look at this set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Wow. The spirit of God is in a baptized disciple the way Peter defines it through the Holy Spirit and the scriptures of the plan of Christ. Come on. Wow. Deposit. So now we're going to talk about do you listen to the right things. What do you pay attention? What gets your attention today? What is most important to you? If someone followed you around for two weeks, what would the investigation say where your heart is? What is valuable to you? Because it doesn't matter what you say. We're not going to listen to what you say. God doesn't listen to what we say. He listens to what we do. Right? Your faith without deeds is dead. You can blow out all the kind of scriptures and preach the powerfulest message and then they follow you around. You do nothing. You're, you're telling the truth, but you're not walking it. There's a problem. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. So a deposit is something that is put on loan and it, it owns you. It's taking you back. You know, in the old days, we used to grab a Coke. We'd get a bottle of Coke. You'd have, if you take the bottle out, you'd have to give them... Like, you have to leave like 10 cents for a deposit. They don't do that anymore, really. But you used to have to, if you wanted the bottle instead of the can, and I was like, I, I don't drink Coca-Cola that much anymore, but, it, you know, the bottle made it cool for me, and I would, you open it up in the commercial day, it looked so cool, and Santa was drinking it during Christmas time. You know, the bottle, the glass bottle, just drinking out of glass, I go, I go, I want the bottle. And they said, well, it's 10 cents, and you can come back, and get a, you, you, get, you get your 10 cents back. Because it was on deposit. The bottle belonged to them. See, the Spirit of God, when God sees you are correct, you're not just emotional, you've studied it out, you examine the Scriptures, you understand what it means to follow Jesus. Grace you need on your best day, your saved by grace, but your heart before God says, yes, I agree, and yes, I believe, and yes, I'm going to depend on you the rest of my life, and I'm sorry for my sins, I repent, and now thank you for the forgiveness in the waters of baptism, and I cannot believe you're going to come inside me and continue to be with me always to the very end of the age. Amen. That gets you tingles. So, we look at um, 1 Thessalonians um, chapter 4, verse 16. It says here, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven 
with a loud command and the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Hey, I would, those are pretty good words. As we were singing one of those songs, and by the way, uh, shout out to Charles and the music ministry, the song leaders ministry. Great job. Guitars coming in, piano. Uh, I love Charles' leadership because he's, he, he's a confident man and he's not afraid to use the people with different talents and put them up front. And that's a confident leader. I mean, music, you do great, but I appreciate music's humility to let Charles lead. But Charles, you'll see, sometimes is over here. He could say, I'm the music leader, I'm doing it. He leads awesomely, he plays the guitar, he's a musician, but you see that he's going, what's best for God's church? And I want to commend you on that, bro. It's pretty awesome. It takes a very, very, very humble, powerful, knowing God's a control leader to do that. Uh, so, in, uh, but here we see the trumpet. You guys, understand, what, are you listening for the right things now? You won't hear the trumpet if you're not listening to the right things now. If you're not walking with God and you're still walking with a guilty conscience, and you know, because you do know, everybody knows, they got a conscience, you may violate it so long that it gets numb, but when it really comes down to it, you know, you know whether you're pleasing God or not. And, you know, those whistles you can blow for the dog, you can't hear them when you blow it, it's like a, such a pitch, have you ever heard of those whistles? You and the dog's like, but you're... And you don't hear anything, but the dog's probably hearing. Ee! That's kind of spiritually. Who's got the deposit? The spirit of those who God knows, those who are his. It's not this church. It's not that church. It's not my opinion. It's not your opinion. It's the words of God's opinion. And you, you humble yourself to the word, and you humble yourself to what Jesus defines as a Christian, and then you build Jesus' definition of a church on each person that says, I will submit to the authority and the way of life, Jesus says, and we're going to be encouraging and helping each other, not judging each other, but helping each other get to heaven, but we're not going to tolerate this way of life for people to come in and sin it up and do whatever they want. Everybody will be expected to go to the grace and repent patiently. We'll be with each other because that's what God is, but we can't allow this way of life that Jesus died for to just let anybody do, everybody do whatever they want because then the church becomes a not church. Right. See what I'm saying? Yes. It's not our church. We're just promising to do what's right in God's eyes. On, the trumpet call. Imagine this. When it comes back, what are you going to hear? See, a communion, if you're walking with God and you're excited, I, I, I sometimes, it's not like I wait for communion to confess my sin. Yes. Through the week, I'm in touch. Yeah. And in communion... There's times where I'm heavy, but other times in communion, I'm just like, thank you. It's not a, I'm just like, I'm just a moment. And then for me, I'm like, I'm remembering when he's going to come back. Because that's what they took communion in the first century. They took it to remember that he's coming back. They, to remember he died, he's coming back. Yeah. To remember the trumpet call. I thank you for this communion and dying for me. Because I'm going to make sure I keep in tune with your word. Yeah. So I can hear the tune of the trumpet. Because when that trumpet goes off... It says trumpet, but I just don't think it's going to sound like any of the world's trumpets. There's going to be something a little bit more, like the best mixing recording artist studio mix. It's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be like, yeah, it's just going to, it's going to grab your ears like those dogs when you go, all the disciples are going to go. But the people that don't have it aren't going to hear it. They're going to keep going, get out of my way. I got to see what time the game's on. Or let me get to my job, make more money, get on my... But the people that are righteous, putting God first, they're going to go... Because see, if you're not listening now for God and you're not in step with God now, why would you be in step when the trumpet plays? Because you're afraid and it's for yourself and you go, well, I don't want to go to hell now. But you didn't live for God before. So it's the wrong motive. Come on. See, I don't want someone marrying me and then I run out of my money and Sonia says, see ya. <laughs> or... I've been trying to go after and quarter for all my life, and then uh, when I'm getting ready to die, somehow some uncle I didn't know of, I inherited a bunch of money, and she shows up and goes, wow, you really are special. I missed that. Can we get married? I'm going to go, that doesn't make sense. Why do you want me now? I'm dying. <laughs> See, God doesn't like that treatment either. He likes you to be loyal and love him in good times, bad times, nothing back. He promises salvation, but walk with him in times of good, in times of bad, because he promises you that he'll save your soul and trials and challenges are for your own good. Amen. 
So when that trumpet call comes back, God decides the end time as we know it. He calls all people, every who have ever lived, who are ever will live. Adam and Eve are going to hear it. Adolf Hitler is going to hear it. Uh, Michael Jackson is going to hear it. All the presidents and the most famous people you ever know are going to hear it, and you're going to hear it. Yes. You're going to be in line. Maybe, maybe, maybe President Trump will be here, and President Putin will be here, and you'll be here, and there won't be any paparazzi anywhere. You'll just be regular humans waiting to stand before God going, I hope I'm all right. And if you're a disciple, you'll have confidence in the blood of Jesus because you'll walk in the light daily and be, and be grateful for the grace. Yes. You won't use grace as an excuse. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. There won't be any black SUVs and red things and bodyguards around. There won't be any, everybody will just be humans going, wow, the world's ended. We're, there is a God. We're going to meet him. And other people are going to go, thank God I listened and accepted the invitation to study the Bible. And thank God I humbled out and just, gosh, I'm so grateful. So grateful that Chad yelled at me outside the door <laughs> in, in 2011 and said, you just need to get it together, dude. Thank you for those kind of yelling talks because that got me back on the walk. Come on. See what I'm saying? <laughs> Point number one. Who you love shows what influences you. Look in John chapter 5, verse 21. You guys with me? John 5, 21. Who you love shows what influences you. Show me your friends, I'll show you who you are. Yes. Show me who's closest to you, and you'll show people who you are. In uh, verse 21, for just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom He is pleased to give it. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, all, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Him. Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears My word and believes Him who sent Me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Yes. Very truly, I tell you, a time is coming and now has come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in Himself, so He's granted the Son also to have life in Himself. And He has given Him authority to judge because He is the Son of Man. And look at verse 28. Do not be amazed at this, because what he just said is pretty amazing for human beings, right? We're like, whoa, he's talking like supernatural after, wow, this is like a science fiction movie. He's saying, don't be amazed at this, because we're human beings. All we know is, we know, it doesn't take faith to know we're going to die, but we don't, no one's, you know, we, no one's gone there yet. But we know that there's, there's a lot more going on. He says, don't be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil, and evil in the Bible means sinful. Evil means disobedient to God. Yeah. Sometimes in a human era today, like, like what Leander was saying, like sometimes uh, some of us can look at greed the way the Bible talks greed. We're like, well, I'm not greedy. I, that's Ebenezer Scrooge, or that's that. You know, no, 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 no. The Bible says, no, you got to get really in touch yeah. with what that heart sin means. Same thing with evil. I'm not evil. No, no. No one is good, Jesus says, not to put us down, to keep yeah. us humble, but sin, willful sin is evil. So, so it's pattern of a life. So those, those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. But, but by, self, by myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Pretty intense. It says a lot about listening. You're going to hear his voice. The power of God's Word has the power to activate dead people to come out of their graves and materialize. Even if, well, what if they've been there for a long time and all they got is bones? Well, He'll bring back all that. What about if you got in a nuclear war and you're incinerated? He'll bring you back. He created the universe with His breath. He, went, he spoke the universe to being. What about the guy that got his leg and arm bit off by a shark? Well, He'll put the arm and leg back on and you'll stand before God in your flesh for judgment. 
Believe me, he can create the universe, he can bring you back. Don't worry about those details. The key here, though, is will you hear it in a way that you, the tune is right, or will it be out of tune, the trumpet? Meaning, if it's out of tune, you're not right. And then, you, then it's too late because your eternity's fixed at death. Your eternity is fixed at death. So, and, and here's the key at the end. He goes, this is what Jesus says, For I seek not to please myself, in verse 30, but him who sent me. What's the key? You're not supposed to live for yourself. You, if you're living for yourself, you've missed God's plan. You live to please God. You live to please God. Jesus didn't come down to live for himself. God, God sustained him. But this is the key. What do you, what, what, what you love? Do you love to please God? Do you love to find out what pleases God? Or do you just go by your mental, emotional thought process of what you think God condones? Really what you're saying is you've been deceived by Satan if you're not going from the word. And your own mind has fooled you with Satan's scheme. Letting you think you're going, God, I love you. Love you. No, you're actually God. Allowing you to believe in a God you, you created in your own mind that's not in the Word. Because if you go by your feelings and your emotions, you're more inclined to be self-protective and just justify like no one's perfect, God knows my heart. But see, when you start reading the Bible, instead of being comfortable, you go, oh my gosh, God does know my heart. I really do need Jesus. Because when you really are honest about the thoughts that go through your head every day and the criticalness and the bitterness and the lack to forgive quickly, you're like, oh. It's not any more comfort. It's like, I need Jesus. Yeah. I need grace. Yeah. See what I'm saying? If you're comfortable with your heart, you're deceived. Because God says the heart is deceitful above all things. So, what influences you? Well, let's look at 1 John 2. 1 John 2. Do you know what it means to please God? I mean, how would you define that? I think if you went out on the street and took an interview on any city... Uh, you'd probably get all kinds of sincere answers. But the only answers that really count are what, the, what God says pleases him. Yeah. And it says in verse 15, do not love the world or anything in the world. Yeah. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life comes not from the Father but from the world. The world and its desires pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. Amen. Now, this is very powerful because some people think worldliness is limited only to exterior, uh, external behaviors. It is, but it's not limited to that. Exterior would be uh, the people you associate with, the places you go, the activities that we enjoy could be very worldly. Like when I became a true Christian and started studying the Bible... I stopped using drugs. I stopped drinking. I stopped sleeping with women. I stopped swearing. I stopped smoking cigarettes. I stopped, I basically had to go, just put me in the manufacturing building and God, you just need to blow me up and give me a new life. And he goes, that's what I'm going to do. That's actually, you're right. We actually, the old is gone. I do need to make, you need to become a new born again because your whole deal's off. Don't be down. You're just a sinner. That's why I sent Jesus. But yeah, everything's pretty much a, you can't go, well, I did this and I didn't. No, no, you just the whole deal's off. Yeah. Well, my girlfriend and I went to church a couple times. You were in bed together before you came to church. You're not married. The whole thing, nothing about it's good for me. It never pleased me. You can't say you're in sin some and then you're loving God some. It's all or nothing. Don't make excuses. Waking up and getting all ready in the same bed and we love God, we're trying. No, you're not. You're lying. Oh, if we break up and move out, what happens? It's going to be expensive. We're in the lease together. Well, you figure it out. The Bible says do not be immoral together. So I'm sorry it's inconvenience. Guess what deny yourself means? That might be some of that. We'll, we'll help you, but you know what? Yeah, it's going to be inconvenient when you get right with God. You can't just say, work with me. Let me stay in sin because I don't have the money. No, no. You start praying for God to help you change and get right yeah. and do what's right. That's the will of God. Now, look at this. It says... Worldliness is also internal because it begins in the heart and is characterized by three attitudes. Let's look at them again. In verse 16, for everything in the world, the first attitude, the lust of the flesh, 
craving for physical pleasure, preoccupation with gratifying physical desires. That's lust of the flesh. Me. That could be sex, impurity. That could be overeating. We've talked about that in the past. That's not self-control. Your, your, your comfort food. You're not hungry, but you're just, that's your God. I've got to be comfortable. Even in movies you see when the girl gets broken up with or the guy, usually it's the girl, I don't know why they pick on her, but she's down and depressed. She'll have a big thing of ice cream and a spoon and a pillow and a blanket on the couch and her friend will come over and encourage her. She's not hungry, she's sad. You see what I'm saying? You remember those movies? They don't eat a gallon every day, but when they're sad, they're not, they're just, they're, they need something to comfort them. And I'm not picking on the ladies, the men do the same thing. They just go in the closet with five Big Macs. <laughs> Food is a God. Food is a small G God. That's why everybody, that's why there's so many overweight, obese people on the planet. God didn't design you to overeat. You eat emotionally, myself included. You have to even understand that. God wants to give you the comfort. So the lust of the flesh. Then the number two is the lust of the eyes. Now that would be craving for everything we see. Coveting and accumulating things, bowing to the small g god of materialism. You know, the phones. Now, understand, I'm giving examples, so don't go trying to defend yourself, because it's fine to buy a new phone every year, but the electronics thing for me, it's not about what you can buy, and it's not about what you do. It's like when you start to follow God, do you live in a way to please God with your life, or do the next newest things please you? I actually was one of those guys years ago when I had my company. If the new phone came out, when I, did my, I was a contractor and I, I was on my truck a lot, and I'd walk around in between things or waiting for a delivery, I'd maybe just pop into this phone store and, and not even planning anything. My phone's fine. It's like, wow, you know, they got the new one. I'm like, what's it look like? I'm like looking at it. You know, it smells good. And it's like, wow. And they say, we could just wipe it out and get you on a 26-month plan and no interest. And I'm like, oh, I... I. And then I'm like, hmm. and then I walk out and I go, why did I even do that? I love my phone. Because that's what everybody does. It's the new upgrade. Get the new upgrade. It, it, now you don't have to even touch it. You can just look at it and it goes, eek. And the next one's going to say, you're so handsome. You're going to be going mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the beautiful of them all? And you're going to go, I got to get that. It's another 1200 but I need that person to tell me I, yeah, I'm awesome. You know, before you had to like just click it on, and then you had to put a pat. Now you can just ding, ding. You know, even the ID thing. It's like and it even, even it, all it does is frustrate us. We get new phones. It take we get angry and have people help us. How, how does this do this? What does this do? And then you annoy your friends that already have one. Now you got to get with them. Keep going. Ding, ding, ding. It's like no, no. Just get, just stay with the simple stuff. But what I'm saying is, it's okay to get a new phone if you can if you can afford it. But if it straps you, the attitude of the heart is like, I gotta have the next thing, gotta have the next thing. You have to make that decision. Is is the stuff you're getting keeping you under your living under your means? Or are you stressed? If you're stressed financially, you're greedy. You're buying too much. You put yourself in that position. You it's the poor me. No, no, no. You just gotta stop saying you need that need versus want, like Aunt Andrea said. Yeah. That's the lust of the eyes. I, I want it. Never have enough. The eyes feed. They never have enough. And that's why even sin, that's why even sin, that's why you got to stay away from, from visual things. You know, what, what's lust lead to? Well, you start looking at pictures or videos or things that make you struggle. You'll never, if you don't stay righteous, you'll feed on that. That's why it becomes such an addiction. Yeah. You just never get enough. And it just warps you and ruins you. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So now, so that the third thing is, um, the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. Pride in our achievements, our possessions, obsession with one's status or importance. The serpent did the same thing with Eve in Genesis. Uh, he tempted her in these areas. Also, the devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness with these exact three areas. It's not like he has a secret, clever plan. It's just you're not in the Bible aware of your sinful nature so you can study out the M.O. like Satan's a terrorist. Study him out. Understand his M.O. He, he, he's revealed completely through the Bible, but no one reads it enough. 
where they, and then they get in their little mind stopped and they're like, that guy hurt me and he hurt me bad. And you just wander around for weeks. And Jesus says, settle matters quickly. Don't go, if the sun goes down and you're still angry, you've blown it. You need to go to that person and get forgiven and hug them extra tight for the next month every time you see them. I love you! And then test yourself and say if you're honest. And say, no, I don't love you. I'm still not honest. We still need to talk. That's what you do. Instead of being fake Molly and Jolly. Fakeness, get out! Be real in the church. Be open. Don't play church with God. Be humble. Be real. Go, my wicked heart has an attitude with you. And yes, it was all your fault, but I still am mad. Okay, great. Let's just keep talking. Because we want it all out. Get it all out. You know, just don't hit me. <laughs> Wait. Keep going, keep going. I'm not being funny, but just get, just get it out. Now let's get back to Jesus. Let's talk. Let's get back to the blood of Jesus. Let's lay and sit at the foot of the cross and look at both of our lives and think about what Jesus did for us and what he could think of us. That'll make you want to forgive quicker. See what I'm saying? By contrast... The world and its desires pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. God values what? Self-control. A spirit of generosity. A commitment to humble service. Whoever does the will of God lives forever. A commitment to humble service. What's that mean? That means you're going to be thinking more about his agenda than yours. Not because you have to. Because it's a privilege. Generosity. Was Jesus generous? He died on the cross. Though he is rich, for, for our sake he became poor. So that through his poverty we may become rich in every way, being saved. We forget that. It is possible to give the impression of avoiding worldly pressure treasures by still harboring worldly attitudes in one's heart. It is possible, like Jesus also, to love sinners and spend time with them while maintaining a commitment to the values of God's kingdom. See, two sides. You can come to church and on the outside look like you're doing well and everything's great. Inside, there's a lot of ugly sin. But you're not humble enough to deal with it. You're distant. You're every, in God's church, you need to be family. Yes. And I'm not just saying throw that word out like we're family. Like on the street. Hey, brother. Hey, sister. You know, people talk. That's not, we're not what's that mean? I don't even know you. Yeah. No, you, you, you are my family. Amen. That takes time and giving and initiative. And it's not, well, I'm going to see if I get, we're going to see if we organically click. or if I. No, that, that's all off the table. That's worldly. You love no matter what. And you ask in prayer for Jesus to help you. So, and then you love sinners. But, but you stay committed to the values of God's kingdom. What values are most important to you? Do your actions reflect the world's values or God's values? Jesus said to Peter, you are Peter. And Jesus said, who do you say I am? After a lot of people were saying, wow, this dude walking around from Nazareth, he's John the Baptist. He's, they're comparing him to Elijah, Jeremiah. And he goes to Simon, well, who do you say I am? And that's what you need to ask your own question with God. Who do you say Jesus is? And if you can answer like Peter, you are the, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. If you can say that, then your walk should be awesomely striving for serving God Amen. and living for God. Not hitting the mark, still failing, having a lot to work on, but you agree. You, I'm God, I need help. Right? Yeah. You are the Christ. And Jesus says, you know what? Now that you got it, you aren't just going to walk away all fired up and lay on the couch. I'm going to now use you to build my church. And I'm going to give you the keys to my kingdom. Amen. And the gates of hell will not overcome it. So once you get it and you become a disciple, he says, now you're going to build my church. That's the will of God. You're a builder. You're building the church and you're showing people how to enter the kingdom of God, which we showed in Acts 2.38. 
You don't just stay around and go, I'm saved, now back to myself. I got my salvation. Now you're back into your self-serving thing. That's, that's totally off. You don't just go to church and listen to the preacher and then go home unrecognizable as a servant of God through the week. That is false doctrine that's been preached for 100 years in America. Listen, go home. Get the missile at... <laughs> Thank you. Hi. And you do your little, and you go home, take off your clothes, and put on your little things, and watch on football or whatever, tennis, or whatever it is, and then go to your job, work hard, but really don't think about anybody else or God's agenda. Come on, Chris. That's not, that's not a disciple. Yeah. Come on, Chris. Look in Psalm 85, 8. Okay. You guys with me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You know what? Yes. Go to Psalm. We're going to crank. I'm coming in in seven minutes. Hurry up. Uh, <laughs> Psalm, Psalm 8, 85. Psalm 85, 8. Come on. Ready? It says here, I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to His people, His faithful servants, and let them not turn to folly. Folly's uh, bad choices. Folly is, is foolish thinking. Folly is wrong decisions. Uh, surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that the glory may dwell in the land. Okay, so uh, the only thing that matters is if Jesus says he knows you, right? Yep. Well, let's look at uh, uh, Matthew uh, 7, verse 21. How do you know you know God? Well, we can't really question each other, right? That'd be, we're not the judge. I can't say you don't know God. How do you know I don't know God? That's not going to help me, buddy. I'm going to say, do you know God? And then, if, and then I can tell you how I'm, how I'm getting to know God, and then I'm going to tell my story, and it's not going to be based on my thought process and my opinions or somebody that just told me opinions. I'm going to go through my journey of conversion of people that got in my life like disciples in the first century, but they, they're carrying the ball like the first century disciples. They did the same thing. Yeah. They pulled me in. I heard the word. They said, you want to study? They looked at things. They asked me where I think I am. I thought I was a Christian. They said, okay. And they didn't even judge me. They said, let's look what the Bible says. And then we looked at the Bible and they said, can you say, does this describe your life? Come on. Well, I'm getting a little uncomfortable. Let's go to the next one. Is this, can you say this is a pattern of your life? Well, I'm getting more uncomfortable. Yeah. No. Let's yeah. go to the next one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you, according to what we've read, the pattern of life, is this your life? Is it defined by Jesus Christian? No. So if you're not a Christian, are you saved? Yes. Okay, if you're not, are you a disciple? No, I'm a Christian. Okay, well, we have to study more. Yeah. Because it's not my opinion, but let's look at the Scripture because you're confused. Well, what do you mean? Uh, well, I know I'm saved. Okay, I'm not going to argue with that. You're very strong. Um, <laughs> do, do you want to look at the Bible, though? Do you want to keep studying and maybe possibly think maybe, uh, and if you are right, it'll just be a refresher. But, but I know for me, when I was showed, I thought I was saved. And I go back to me, I go, and I looked at the Bible, honestly, and I went, and I started getting uncomfortable again. That's my uncomfortable. That's my uncomfortable look, Tish. No, Tish likes that. This is my. I don't say anything, but everybody can see I'm really uncomfortable because my pride's not allowing me to go, wow, that's interesting. I've never done that before. Can I learn more? No, I'm like. Because how dare anybody tells me I'm not saved, even though I never knew why I'm saved, except someone told me something. And I went to church. Let's look at uh, Matthew 7 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of, the, of my Father who's in heaven. Amen. So what's the key? Not earning it. It's heart. If you are saved by grace, your grace will teach you to say no, and you'll be moved by God's love to want to please Him and want to serve until you go home. Amen. It'll just be a moving desire so your faith will prove it's a saving faith. Not because you have to do anything, but saving faith is it accompanied with obedience, which is deeds. Yeah. But you're not saved by deeds. But you're moved to do things and obey God, so it does take effort to obey God. It takes priority. It takes decisions. It takes sacrifice. That's all working hard sometimes. But it's a blessing if you're doing it and you have the right priority. When you're working hard and believing in something even on this earth, and you're, you're passing or getting rewards or getting promoted, you're feeling good, but you worked hard. Yes. Yeah. That's the same principle. But, you don't, but God, doesn't, God doesn't say you have to, but... Your, the love of response to grace shows a saved heart. That's, it's the fruit. You'll know him by the fruit. Now, but he says, look what he says here. 
Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. I never knew you? They're going, Lord, Lord, finally, finally. It's so good to see you. He's like, are you talking to me? I don't know you. That's a judgment. You think people are going to freak out at that? I don't know you. And their whole eternity is done. Because really they were prideful and they went by their own feelings and their own brought up life. And my grandmother or my great aunt always said this. Doesn't mean she was meant wrong. You just never went to the Bible and said, show me that. Yeah. See, when I found out I wasn't saved, I went, ah! <laughs> I, go, I did. I, went, I don't know if I did that, but I, I was shocked. <laughs> and then after I figured out I wasn't saved, all of a sudden these explosions came and I go, I started thinking about all the people I know and all my family. That, uh, that's right. I know it. Oh, my gosh. And then the guy said, calm down. <laughs> Come to your senses, man. He slapped me. Like, just no, no, he just said, calm down. Calm down. It's just you are in front of the Bible right now. You make decisions and get right. God is the one that decides. You can be used, but don't let your sentimentality and fear stop you. Yes. The, either you're going to put the truth and love God's word above everything. Even emotions and sincerity and even others. Don't worry, you're not judging. You can just share your experience and then show them the Bible. Amen. And say, this is what I've been learning. This is what I'm learning. I did not know this. I wasn't aware of this. Take responsibility for you. Let everybody else ask questions that they want. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Now, I don't know you, so let's look at uh, Matthew 6, 6. And I've been talking about this, and, I, and I'm going to call you guys, because if you know God... How do you say you know God? Well, these are some facts. If you love me, you'll obey me. John 14, 23 says, if you love me, you will obey me. Jesus says that. So love for God is obedience. So, well, how do you get to seek obedience? Well, God says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And they met every day and unity and building something takes commitment to build something. If you see a construction program, a, a, a construction project, you see all the trucks and everybody pulling up. Guess what? The behind the scenes, there was funding. There was investors going in. They were hiring the contractors. The deal was being worked on for a, for a while. It comes together. Monday morning, the project starts. I promise. The guys that are hired don't show up. They're fired. Yeah. They call in sick. I got the sniffles. I can't make it Wednesday night. Oh, that's like a pattern because you never make it. There's always a reason. What's wrong? I'm not judging you, but I need someone to Are you going to build with us? See what I'm saying? It's the same thing, but you start the, you know, it's your decision. No one's going to judge you, but really, where's your heart? What's the most important thing? Yeah. Loving one another, coming together, keeping the unity, guarding the way of life. It's not because you have to. It's because there's nothing more important to show the world, not only individually, but collectively, there are people that can behave like Jesus and be humble when they sin. So Matthew 6 Six, and I'm not going to have everybody raise their hand, but if you're visiting, I've been asking the church if they do this. Look at verse six. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep babbling on like a pagan, for they think they're heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our debts or our sins, and as we forgive all who sin against us, and lead us not into temptation, deliver us from the evil one, making it clear there is a dark evil force that Satan is leading. And, and then it says, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive you. Wow. Now, I've been asking our church, in verse 6, a while back, about a year ago, I've seen the scripture, but for a year and a half, I've been going and closing the door by myself because I'm really intrigued about the reward part. And don't lie, you're motivated by rewards. God created us all by rewards. You get a bonus, you get an incentive, you won the lottery, you're excited. Reward! You get excited. Just be real. We all get excited by little, oh, you got a present for me. No, you didn't have to, but you're excited. Yeah. Yeah. So when God says it, he knows us, but we don't do it to get it. But he says this. Look at this. When you pray, go in your room, close the door, pray to your father, who is unseen. 
Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. I've been asking the people in our church. I've been not telling them. I said, I appeal to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I did a bunch of prayer life stuff. I showed the prayer pattern of people in the, in the Bible who had reverence. And all of them, even Jesus, his last prayer was hanging on the cross, half mangled, almost dead, going, forgive them, Father, for they don't do. And then the one before that, he was on his face, overwhelmed with emotions, to say, God, please help me to do your will, not, not my will. Please take it away, though, if you can. But if it's your will, I'm doing it. So he's on his face. Mm-hmm. We're supposed to follow Jesus. I've been asking people, how many people go in their room by themselves? And the knee part I threw in because Jesus was heard because of reverent submission. I don't know any way other than, because I can't earn my salvation, I don't know any way else for me to show God my reverent submission than getting on my hands and knees and bowing and sitting before I speak. That's me. Because I can't earn it, I can't buy it, but when I realize the closer I'm getting to God and talking to Him, I go, oh. But then I know I don't need to go, I'm going to go have my prayer time where I come home and say, I just had a power of prayer time. No, I just do it on my own. No one needs to know. I do it. Because I want to see if that comes true. And you know what he, what's he rewards you with? There's not a Ferrari or as Leandro would want, a Dodge out of the driveway. <laughs> <laughs> Leandro, you're funny words. I love you. She goes, if I got a million dollars, you know, what would you do? I, mean, I want to buy a Dodge. I think most people would be like Ferrari, Testarossi. <laughs> but he says he's going to reward you. What's he going to reward you with? What does you do? Nothing but go in the room by yourself, get on your knees and speak to air. Or to the God you really believe in that's unseen, that can do anything wow. imaginably more than you could ever imagine or ask for, but you don't believe it. Because if you're not doing it, then you're, look at this, is amazing. I, mean, I said go to Walmart at 3 o'clock every Sunday, and you can't be one minute late. There's going to be a guy, and if you say, Dodge, they're going to give you a $1,000 bill. If you're, if you're 301, you don't get it. You guys would have tents. No one would be late. I wouldn't either. <laughs> but here God's saying this. God's saying don't do it just to try to get it. A pattern of life. Do you really know God? I don't know you. You can obey. You can come to church. You can serve at the orphanage. You can do everything. But if you don't take time with God, then how do you really know him? And he says here, why won't you get alone every time? No TV, nothing. Stop life. Because yes. God's more important. Don't bring him on your errands. And go, I paid him in the car to work. That's great. And there's nothing wrong with that. But, but put him first. Yeah. Don't on. just take him along like a side buddy. Show him the respect. And you don't have to go, I have to have a long-winded prayer. Just be honest. Don't even speak. Maybe some of you don't even pray right anymore. Father God, Father God, Father God, I'm nervous. Just shut up. And don't speak till you feel like speaking. Don't just throw words in. He doesn't want to hear the nervousness. Just, just start with the Father. I get to call you Father. Now ask yourself, do you really feel like he's your Father? Do you feel like a loving, comforting, perfect Father? Then say, God, I'm sorry. I don't feel that right now. Be honest. And then go help me to get that. Hallowed be your name. That means I need to respect you. Then talk about it. Then your will be done. And you're, you're too anxious and worried all about your stuff. You can't even concentrate. You're going, what about this one? you got to wait. And go, I need to do your will and forget about all my problems. Amen. And then you get to your day. God, help me with my day, my work. Help me overcome the sins I'm fighting. Most of my prayers are trying to be like Jesus now. Not trying to get stuff. Yeah. I'm like, help me love more. Help me have more patience. Help me have more energy. Help me have wisdom to know what to say because I feel like a three-legged nightmare. Help me to know how to help this person. Yeah. That's my prayers. I don't really want anything. I got everything. So I want to leave with the challenge. I appeal to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that all of you who aren't doing this, do this. Do it. Every day. Amen. And the Father who sees you and sees what you do in secret, He says He will reward you. But if you have one even flicker of an attitude toward anyone, your sins are bouncing off the ceiling and right back to you. You're wrong with God. Look what it says in 14. For if you forgive other people if they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive others. I'm done. But if you do not forgive others, wait, wait, if you do not forgive others their sins, they will not forgive you. You guys, as Christians, sometimes we walk around and actually have to, have to be prodded and got with and helped over time to actually forgive somebody. Good night. 
Do you understand? The minute you decide I'm not forgiving them, and even if it was 100% their fault, you better start working on your heart, pal. Yeah. Because you got a problem. It's not even about that person anymore. God says, I don't care if the guy wants to kill you again. Forgive him. How do I do that? You start praying. God, help me have a heart that I, that's not my heart because it's impossible for me to do that. That's your prayers. So, guys, you want to know God, take this challenge. If you're visiting, take this challenge. Do it every day. Come back next Sunday, and I promise there will be a difference in your, in your, in your faith. Amen. You're going to walk in there and say, the pastor told me to do that. You're going to walk in your closet, shut the door, and you're going to go, what am I doing? The pastor said that. And you're going to get down. It's going to be weird. And you're going to get down, and then you're going to, what do I say? And then you're going to be really surprised how shallow some of your prayer lives are. Amen. Which I'm not trying to make you feel bad. Get closer to God. God be the glory. Amen. Amen.